Good afternoon and welcome to today's IAC webinar, Fetal Echocardiography Protocol and Technique. My name is Kelly Baer and I am the Creative Design Manager with Marketing Communications at IAC. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions. To do so, use the questions tab located on the left side of your screen. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar as we will monitor questions throughout the presentation and try to answer as many of them as possible during the Q&A period. Also on the left sidebar, please note the resources tab. Click on this tab for a link to today's handout, a PDF copy of these PowerPoint slides. Select the file name to download the handout. Lastly, on the lower left of the player, please note the request support button. If you experience any technical problems during this webinar, click this button. A technical expert will be there to assist you with any issues you may have. For those who like to take notes during the presentation, look to the right of the slides and click the notes tab. There you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. To be eligible for the ASE CEU credit, you must be registered, logged into this webinar, then complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. If you are viewing this webinar in a group, please be sure you are also individually registered and logged into this webinar on another computer or device so that we have record of your attendance today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. This webinar is a joint presentation of IAC, SOAP, and ASE. And now I would like to introduce today's guest presenter, Michelle Perez. Michelle is a clinical ultrasound educator specializing in high-risk obstetrics and fetal echocardiography at Scripps Health Division of Maternal Fetal Medicine in San Diego, California. She has over 16 years of experience in academic medicine at the University of California San Diego Medical Center, serving as a clinical instructor and faculty lecturer for departments of radiology, obstetrics and gynecology, and reproductive sciences at UC San Diego School of Medicine. She is a true expert in the field, and we are happy to have her with us today. And with that said, I will now turn this webinar over to today's speaker, Michelle Perez. Michelle? Thank you. Thank you so much. I wanted to thank the um, IAC for inviting me to speak on fetal echocardiography um, and also share my knowledge in terms of protocol and technique. So my only disclosure is I do lecture for GE Healthcare. So in the next hour, we're going to review the standard sonographic views for fetal echocardiography according to the AIOM guidelines also recognize the sonographic features um, of the common congenital heart disease encountered in practice and discuss fetal heart image optimization tips and a few pearls to take home. So the AIUM practice parameter for the performance of fetal echocardiography was developed in collaboration with these um, organizations as you see listed. So this is to provide the medical ultrasound community with recommendations for the performance and recording of high quality fetal echo exams. So before I move forward with the imaging guidelines, let's just review the common fetal and maternal conditions associated with an increased risk of um, congenital heart disease. However, to note, most congenital heart disease are not associated with any known risk factors, but often suspected at the time of an anatomic ultrasound survey. So with fetal factors, fetal echo is reasonable, fetal echo is indicated if there's a suspected cardiac structure abnormality, suspected abnormality in cardiac function, high drops, persistent fetal tachycardia, this is with a fetal heart rate of greater than 180 beats per minute, persistent fetal bradycardia, with a fetal heart rate of less than 120 beats per minute, or even a suspected heart block, and frequency episodes of a persistently irregular cardiac rhythm, major fetal extracardiac anomalies, and a nuchal translucency of 3.5 millimeters or greater or above the 99th percentile for gestational age. Chromosome abnormalities by invasive genetic testing or cell-free DNA screening and monochorionic twinning. Now fetal echo is reasonable or may be considered um, with findings of systemic venous anomalies such as persistent right umbilical vein, left SVC, and even absent ductus venosus or greater than normal nuchal translucency measurement between 3.0 to 3.4 millimeters. 
Now, maternal or familial disease or maternal environmental exposure, fetal echo is indicated with pre-gestational diabetes, regardless of hemoglobin A1C levels, gestational diabetes diagnosed in the first or early second trimester, IVF, including ICSI, um, maternal uh, phenylketonuria, autoimmune disease, such as um, uh, anti-SSA, with or with or with a prior effective fetus and first degree relative of a fetus with CHD such as parents siblings or prior pregnancy and first or second degree relative with disease of Mendelian inheritance and a history of childhood cardiac manifestations retinoid retinoid exposure and first trimester rubella infection now fetal echo is reasonable or may be considered under maternal factors with teratogen exposure antihypertensive medication um, autoimmune disease, SSA antibodies with a prior affected fetus or second degree relative of a fetus with congenital heart disease. As for these specific indications as we see here and also isolated conditions, there is minimal increased risk for congenital heart disease above the general population. So the detail uh, 7, 6, 8, 11 exam may be appropriate, which includes you know, an evaluation of the fetal heart. So fetal echo is performed only when there is an abnormality detected. So this is for gestational diabetes, warfare and exposure, alcohol exposure, echogenic focus in the heart, maternal fever or viral infection, and isolated congenital heart disease, and the relative further removed from second degree to the fetus. And also goes for this as well. Um, you know, fetal echo is performed if an abnormality is detected on a 7, 6, 8, 11 exam. We have obesity with a BMI of greater than 30. Um, selective uh, ser serotonin reuptake inhibitor antidepressant exposure, non-cardiac soft marker for aneuploidy in the absence of karyotype information, abnormal maternal serum analytes, and also isolated single umbilical artery. So fetal echocardiography is commonly performed between 18 and 22 weeks gestational age, although some cardiac structures may be better visualized before or even after this period. And also with uh, fetuses with severe complex congenital heart disease, we could actually see these in the first trimester. So now moving on to the imaging guidelines. So what is required in the updated fetal echo guidelines? So here you could see um, just a chart of the required imaging. Um, we have you know, 2D in grayscale imaging. We have the four chamber to include the pulmonary veins. So the areas that are actually highlighted in yellow um, depict what is currently updated in the guidelines. We have the short axis views at the level of the four chamber uh, for ventricles, low for ventricles, heart rate and rhythm assessment. Um, we also include the left ventricular outflow track, right ventricular outflow track, uh, short axis view high to include the outflows, branch pulmonary artery and bifurcation, three vessel views, including the uh, pulmonary main pulmonary with artery bifurcation, and also the uh, three vessel and trachea view, ductal and aortic arch, and the superior and inferior vena cava. For color Doppler, we now have the pulmonary veins, um, at least uh, one right and one left. Uh, atrial ventricular valves, atrial septum and foramen ovale. We also have the right and left semilunar valves and also including the three vessel trachea views, ductal aortic arch and superior vena cava. And as well, also the ductus venosus. As for pulse wave Doppler, we have the right and left AV valves, pulmonary veins, at least two, one right vein and one left vein, um, a right and left semilunar valves and as for the rest, those are all you know, clinically relevant or needed. And for cardiac biometry, Z-scores are not currently part of the guidelines. They're not required, although we do measure tricuspid and mitral valve annulus and diastole with absolute size with comparison of left to right-sided valves and aortic and pulmonary valve annulus in systole. And the rest, as for three vessels and the arches, that would be you know, clinically indicated. Now, additional fetal, fetal cardiac biometry is performed if an abnormality is suspected. In case, you know, if there is right and left ventricular lengths, uh, we have the aortic arch and isthmus diameter measurements from the sagittal arch view or three vessel trachea view, um, main pulmonary artery along with the ductus arteriosus measurements and diastolic ventricular diameters, um, just inferior to the AV valves, cardiothoracic ratio, or if clinically relevant, we have the systolic ventricular dimensions, short and long axis views, transverse atrial dimensions, and branch pulmonary artery dimensions. And um, cardiac function assessment is done if clinically relevant, as well as complementary imaging strategies, strategies to include 3D and 4D tissue and continuous wave Doppler and other additional functional assessments. 
Now we have also specific documentation, which requires motion video clips. So in addition to still frames, um, these are needed for documentation. Now, if there's any, you know, suspected structural or functional cardiac abnormalities, um, additional clips are needed. So the required clips include an axial sweep from the abdomen to the three vessel trachea view. We have the four chamber with 2D and color Doppler, left ventricular outflow tract, that applies to and also to the right ventricular outflow tract, three vessel and tracheal view, and sagittal, aortic, and ductal arches, all with color and also in grayscale imaging. So these are the required motion video clips. So the fetal echocardiogram is a detailed evaluation of the cardiac structure and function. So of course the assessment, you know, involves um, sequential segmental analysis. So starting with initial assessment, uh, determining uh, fetal right and left orientation. So this will be part of your uh, visceral and abdominal situs. And also assessment of the atrial relationship situs, as well as the atrial ventricular junctions ventricular relationship with the ventricular arterial junctions and also great arterial relationships. Um, so this is, you know, pretty much just for a sequential seg segmental analysis of the four basic areas. And we measure you know, fetal biometry prior to evaluating the heart. And this is just to confirm gestational age and Z-score correlation. Again, Z-score is um, not required as uh, part of the guidelines, but it's also an option. Ooh, so moving on to my favorite part. So with fetal echocardiography, these are the representative scan planes for fetal echo. So here we have the four chamber view, as you see down below, left ventricular alpha tract. We have the RVOT view, three vessel view with main pulmonary artery bifurcation, three vessel view with ductal arch, the three vessels and trachea view. So the initial assessment should always start with fetal situs and also determine fetal left and right orientation. And here we're actually including the four chamber, as you can see, starting from the abdomen all the way to the four chamber and up to the three vessel trachea view. So what, so here you could actually see that the stomach is imaged on the left side of the abdomen. Um, here, we're also able to appreciate the portal sinus with an L shape to the right. And also, if you notice, you see the descending aorta is posterior to the left and the IVC anterior to the right. So very careful attention to these specific structures as, you know, any displacement or, uh, or abnormal location may be suspicious for heterotaxy. And by taking an axial sweep from the abdomen to the four chamber view to the three vessels in trachea, here you could see a nice four chamber view with apex of the heart pointing towards the left side of the fetal chest. And this confirms your fetal situs. So the four chamber view, as you could see here, includes the pulmonary veins is a key scanning plane. So here you can actually see three different, you know, angle of insinations or angle acquisitions of the four chamber. And clear enough, the pulmonary veins in grayscale. So at least two. Um, so of course, this helps a lot with, you know, the advent of high resolution transducers and also proper image optimization. So this is a required view and clip. So when assessing for position and access of the, at the level of the heart, you want to draw a line down the middle, traversing through the right ventricle. So the majority of heart is on the left side, apex leftward with symmetric lungs, axis leftward and 45 degrees plus or minus 20 degrees. And um, the heart should occupy at least a third of the chest and this is assessed as surface area. And in circumference, it is about one third to one half of the thor thoracic cavity in the transverse view. Now, both of these values remain constant throughout gestational age. So when assessing for four chamber symmetry, you wanna make sure that the, you know, the right and the left side of the heart are symmetric. So here we have the right ventricle, right atria, and the left ventricle and the left atria. Now at times during the late third trimester, you know, the right ventricle may appear slightly enlarged compared to the left ventricle. So this can be a marker for like coarctation or this or other cardiac abnormalities. But on the other hand, this could also be, you know, normal as you know, it, it could be a normal variant of third trimester disproportion. So what you could do is, you know, if you have any suspicion for any type of asymmetry with the chambers, you wanna assess the chambers in different views, which can help in confirming chamber disproportion. 
So again, you want to utilize different scan planes or scan angles when assessing for symmetry. So when looking at the heart, you want to make sure that there's absence of pericardial fusion and also a pleural fusion. And when assessing the heart, it has to be in a regular danceable cardiac rhythm. Now, sometimes, um, you know, you can see a little bit of fluid surrounding the heart and that could be abnormal. And especially with these high resolution probes, you think pretty much there's, you know, fluid surrounding everything, you know, within the fetus, like structures tend to be darker and um, or even brighter. So if you're unsure if the hypochoic space you see here is pericardium versus pericardial fusion, all you need to do is turn on your color Doppler, as you can see here. And since pleural fusion is moving fluid, it will fill with color. So this is a, a, a pericardial effusion. Now, here's an example of a, you know, questionable pericardial effusion. And this is pretty much just due to the anechoic area that we see there right by the heart. But when we turn on color Doppler, it does not light up. So there's no fusion there, but normal heart tissue. So turn, on, turn your color on to confirm for any pericardial effusion. So let's take a closer look at the specific structures of the four chamber. So here we have the right ventricle, which is located anteriorly. We have the moderator band, which is uh, one of the morphologic characteristics of right ventricle, the tricuspid valve. Um, we also have the right atrium, which is anterior to the left atrium. And also just to note, the tricuspid valve inserts more apically in comparison to the mitral valve. Now, looking at the left side of the heart, we have the left ventricle, which is posterior to the right ventricle. We have the formino valley, which flaps from right to left, as you can see here. We also have the pulmonary veins, which um, are these, see, are they're seen as slit-like openings in the posterior wall of the left atrium. And also the descending aorta, which should be the only vessel behind the left atrium and no other vessel in between. Now, looking at valve morphology, um, the tricuspid valve is, as I mentioned, more slightly apically offset than the mitral valve. So this is very important to assess, as this can represent a very a, an, an anatomic feature that is typically absent in atrial ventricular septal defects. When measuring um, the, for when assessing for AV valve measurements, you want to, when, when observing, obs evaluating the valves, AV valves open symmetrically. And you have to remember these valves are thin, delicate leaflets. Um, so opening symmetrically and you want to measure the tricuspid valve and mitral valve in diastole. You want to place the calipers at the hinge points of the valve. Okay, so looking at this here, this case one, suspected ventricular septal defect. But looking at this uh, first image, we can see that when the patient was referred to us, we're like, okay, you know, maybe this heart, sorry, I kind of gave away the answers there, but this heart here, you know, just looking at the four chamber, it looks, it looks, might look okay. You know, there's the access seems just right. There seems like there's symmetry. But once we, you know, scanning the patient and we have a nice apical insonation in which we're able to assess the valves, we notice that there's linear insertion of the valves. And clearly this is abnormal. But as you can see in this clip here, you can see a large atrial and ventricular septal defect at the region of the AV valves. So this ended up being consistent with, sorry, there I gave away my answer again. This ended up being consistent with an atrial uh, ventricular septal defect. And here you could see the characteristic um, classic features of AVSD. You can see a hole in the heart and with color Doppler, just confirms a single channel of blood entering the ventricles over a common AV valve. So again, um, you know, utilizing just different scanning planes and angles to assess um, you know, any specific structure is key to identifying certain defects. When um, we, we utilize color Doppler to assess the mitral valve and tricuspid valve inflow, so you want to do this in an apical four chamber view since your angle of insonation is parallel to the direction of blood flow. So again, if you notice that my, my color box is pretty much tight around my structures and just this, this is just mainly to have to increase the frame rate, which is ideal for detail resolution. You want a higher frame rate with good detail resolution. Scale should be set to high. So this is a PRF anywhere I would say greater than 60 to 80 centimeters. 
So sometimes this can vary because all, all of this is pretty much dependent on maternal body habitus and also fetal position. And flow should be from the atria to the ventricles. And when assessing uh, with pulse wave Doppler, you want to place the sample gate just distal to the AV valve in the ventricle. Um, normal waveforms is a biphasic waveform, as we see here. We had E wave, which is for, represents early diastole, A wave, late diastole, uh, and the atrial kick. And the E wave velocity should be less than A wave velocity in the fetus. So when looking at the pulmonary veins, as I expressed earlier, here we're able to um, you know, easily identify the pulmonary veins now on a four-chamber view. And this is just showing uh, we're able to see it at 18 weeks, 25 weeks, and even 34 weeks. And this is you know, with the help of you know, the advent of high-resolution transducers and also you know, improving your optimization techniques. Um, you notice that you can see the slit-like openings in the posterior wall of the left atrium. So it's very important to visualize at least one pulmonary vein on each side in grayscale, especially prior to turning on color. And I just thought, you know, this was just a helpful diagram of showing the location, you know, the pulmonary veins, um, you know, pretty much um, uh, when you angle your transducer towards the left atrial posterior wall, and you could actually see it really nicely here. And this is just a corresponding ultrasound image uh, to this diagram. When assessing pulmonary veins with color Doppler, um, technique is key to seeing these uh, little small structures. Again, you want to have a color box to small, and this is just to increase your high frame rate. I would say less than 30 centimeters per second. And also, you want to assess the direction of flow into the left atrium. And, you know, when in doubt, uh, we use um, pulse Doppler just to confirm the flow we are actually seeing is a pulmonary vein and normal Doppler pattern for a pulmonary vein is forward flow, triphasic waveform, as you can see here, the S wave, uh, systole is the first component, then D wave, early diastole, and the lowest component is the A wave, which is the atrial kick and late diastole. And as part of the new guidelines, we want to do pulse wave Doppler at least uh, one on each side, one inferior and one superior. Case number two, normal or abnormal. So we have image A of four chamber heart in the apical view and image B four chamber heart as well. So I'll give you a second just to kind of think and look and see just by looking at this four chamber view. So, well, if you guys are pretty much sharper than I am, um, here we have B, which is a normal four chamber view and A, which is abnormal. So here, as you can clearly see, um, looking at the pulmonary veins, you can see with the normal pulmonary veins, you could actually see it in grayscale inserting to the posterior portion of the left atrium. But if you notice the pulmonary veins in A, it doesn't seem to be entering. And it almost has like an abnormal shape, almost like a twig. And here's just a showing with color Doppler, um, showing the normal comparison to the, uh, to the fetus with TAPVR, um, you know, it's, it's very important to identify pulmonary veins as with color, as you can see, this is going in the correct direction. So again, this can be very tricky and, you know, it's very helpful to assess, um, you know, pulmonary veins in grayscale prior to turning on color Doppler and how this could actually be easily missed. So grayscale clues when uh, for total anomalous pulmonary veins return. So it's very important to take a look at the retro atrial space. There's an increased distance between the left atrium and the descending aorta in comparison to, you know, the normal heart. We don't see that increased distance. And if you notice too, you could see what looks like an enlarged um, right atrium. And this is due to the increased venous pressures and also a smooth left atrial wall. So we don't see any of those pulmonary veins actually, um, you know, draining indirectly into that left uh, posterior wall. And uh, also, some has referred to this as the twig sign, because it does pretty much kind of look like a twig, as you can see. And that's due to the, the confluence of the veins. And there we go, all my animations. And of course, the twig sign. So when moving on to the subcostal view, there's several structures that you could assess as well. Um, here, you could, uh, here you could see the trabeculations of the right ventricle and also the um, apical insertion of the cord tendon of the tricuspid valve to the right ventricular wall and the apex of the heart, which are important morphologic characteristics of the right ventricle. 
Um, we can also see that there is an intact septum as you know, our beam is perpendicular to our septum. So here, this is the best view to see it. We also notice that the left ventricle is conical in shape. And remember the left ventricle and the right ventricle make up the apex of the heart. Also other structures you could see is the pretty much the descending aorta. And as well as you could see pulmonary veins also in this view. So when assessing for the foramen ovale, I found it very helpful to find the foramen ovale first with grayscale and then turn on my color Doppler. So for technique, uh, you want to keep your color box small. Again, it's, you know, it's very important to optimize 2D image first before adding color. And you want to set, uh, set your scale to low, so I'd say less than 30 centimeters per second. And you want to be able to assess, you know, assess the flow across the PFO. It should be from right to left. So here you can see it in grayscale really nicely from right to left and with color just pretty much confirms um, the direction of flow. So as I mentioned earlier, angle of insinuation is key. So when evaluating the septum, the subcostal four chamber view is, is the best, you know, to assess the interventricular septum. Um, you want to sweep the septum because remember septum has depths. So starting from the four chamber and going all the way up to the outflows and keep your color box small just to focus on the region of interest and with a low PRF of less than 30 centimeters per second, mid to low wall motion filter. So what do we see here? So here, as we're looking at this four chamber heart, here we have what possibly could be a questionable VSD. We don't know, but what is wrong here? Actually to assess the for ventricular septal defects, this is an incorrect um, angle of insinuation. So again, you wanna change your angle of insinuation. And here you could see that there's truly no ventricular septal defect, but just a hypochoic, just a, a hypochoic dropout with the beam and the interventricular septum. Case three. So here's a case um, where they suspected there was a ventricular septal defect. So this came, you know, they did their, the MFMs uh, did their anatomy scan and the reports stated a VSD, referred for fetal echo. But what are the things that you notice here if that's wrong? First, you notice that the PRF is set to high. So obviously that's incorrect technique for assessing for, inter, you know, for um, VSDs. And as well, what else? This is the incorrect angle of insinuation for assessing for ventricular septal defects. So lo and behold, patient was referred for a fetal echo. And here we have the correct beam, correct angle of insinuation, which the beam is perpendicular to the septum. And with a correct PRF of 2.4, which is appropriate, so anything less than 30 centimeters per second. And there is no, ended up being a normal fetal echo. So again, you know, very important when, uh, when you're utilizing your technique, you want to ask yourself, what is it that you're trying to assess? You know, if you want to assess the, the valves, the AV valves, and you want to be perpendicular uh, for, you know, you want to assess for any offset. If you want to assess the interventricular septum, you want to be perpendicular to the beam. Okay, so now moving on into the outflows. So just going through the normal left ventricle alpha tract anatomy, we have the left ventricle, the ascending aorta, the aortic valve, the ventricular interventricular septum, the right ventricle, the left atrium, and the mitral valve. And I've mentioned earlier, the ascending aorta, which should be the only vessel behind the left atrium. And you know, when it's that, when assessing, you want to take a look at the nature of the aorta, uh, you know, is rising from the left ventricle. Um, aorta is normal in caliber throughout. And also take a look at the continuity of the wall of the aorta with the mitral valve leaflet, and also continuity of the interventricular septum with the wall of the aorta. And again, it's very important to pay attention to the valves as valves should move freely and come and go in systole and diastole. And so when assessing, uh, you know, aortic valve, for aortic valve measurements, uh, we measure this in systole. So again, you know, paying attention to the valves, remember valves come and go and, and, and they um, open and close in systole and diastole. You want to place your calipers at the hinge points of the valve during systole. And with the color Doppler, um, you want your scale should be set to high with a PRF of anywhere greater than 60 to 80 centimeters. 
Um, flow should be from the left ventricle to the aorta. It's very important to optimize your Doppler angle, especially when assessing for, you know, for a pulse wave Doppler and Doppler gate is placed just distal to the valve for peak systolic velocity. And again, normal flow is smooth laminar flow. So case number four, is this normal or abnormal? So looking at these color flows, we're looking at the left ventricular outflow tract. We know the normal flow of B, smooth laminar flow. Um, but if you notice in A, as we have the color there, we notice that there's a little bit of aliasing or some type of flow disturbance. So this should, you know, immediately, once you turn on color, this should immediately raise red flags. So A, you know, ended up being abnormal. You could see in compared to normal. So this ended up being a fetus with critical aortic stenosis. So as you can see, you know, color is also as helpful as grayscale, but grayscale is just as important in color. So you can see with grayscale imaging, um, you notice that there's post stenotic dilation. Um, and also uh, if you're paying attention to the valve leaflets, the valve leaflets are very, um, are, it's not completely disappearing within the cycle. And just with confirmation, you can see how the color Doppler is normal. And this was consistent with critical aortic stenosis. And with peak systolic velocities, um, which is 148 centimeters per second of pulse wave. And, and so it's very important, again, that you know, when, you, when you see color, uh, using blue light color, you want to see smooth laminar flow. And again, correct Doppler of, um, um, angle of incination as well. So it's speaking of angle of incination and angle of acquisition, um, I feel it is very important, you know, to assess, um, you know, fetal heart structures in different views because in an ideal world or in a perfect world, we know that, you know, we can't always get the perfect views. So again, these are just different angle of incinations. So you want to be familiar with non-traditional views. So here's a sweep from the subcostal view. Um, this happens to be one of my favorite views. And here you're able to assess, you know, many structures. So here we're able to assess the um, interventricular septum, um, specifically the paramembranous area. We're able to also assess for any, um, of any um, aortic override. And also we're able to see the aortic valve. And with, you know, with color Doppler, again, you want to assess the flow across the aortic valve. You should utilize a high PRF of greater than 60 to 80 centimeters per second, or you could also assess the septum. But in this case, you would actually have to drop your technique to a low PRF of about less than 30 centimeters per second. Again, normal flow is smooth laminar flow. Okay, so looking at these two clips, is this normal or abnormal? So here you could see that B is normal. You could see a nice intact um, ventricular septum continuity with uh, the, the wall of the aorta to the interventricular septum. But you notice in A, this is abnormal. So here we see you know, a defect along the interventricular septum, and this is consistent with an overriding aorta with a ventricular septal defect. So we're moving on to the right ventricular alpha tract. So here we have your right ventricle, tricuspid valve, right atrium, pulmonic valve, aorta, pulmonary artery, ductus arteriosus, also the right pulmonary artery. Um, you can't see the left pulmonary artery is not seen in this view. But here you could actually see it. So when assessing the pulmonary artery, uh, we wanna make sure that it is greater, if not equal to the aorta. And again, when assessing the valves of the pulmonary, uh, pulmonic valve, they move freely and they come and go in systole and diastole. So again, very important to pay attention to the valves. And here in this view, we're able to appreciate the main pulmonary artery branching to include the left pulmonary artery and the right pulmonary artery. So this is again, another important anatomic characteristic that differentiates it from the ascending aorta. So again, PA should never be smaller than the aorta. When measuring the pulmonary valve measurements, this would be measured in systole. Um, this is also part of the required um, new practice parameters. Again, when assessing the valves, valves come and go, and you want to place your calipers at the hinge points of the valve during systole. And assessing for color, 
<clears throat> flow through the pulmonic valve. Normal flow is smooth laminar flow. And here, scale should be set to high with a PRF at least greater than 60 centimeters to 80 centimeters per second. And flow should be from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery. Again, very important to optimize your Doppler angle. And you want to place the Doppler gate, just uh, place distal to the valve for peak systolic velocity. Case number five. So is this normal or abnormal? So what is it that you notice here? This is almost like a level of the three vessel view. So here we can see that looking at this, we can see the pulmonary artery. So B, we have the normal pulmonary artery, which is equal if not slightly greater than the aorta. But in image A, this is abnormal. So here you can see that the pulmonary artery dimensions is smaller than the aorta. So this fetus was consistent with tetralogy of fallot. Again, it's very important to pay attention to dimensions and the pulmonary artery should never be smaller than the aorta. So here's another great sweep. Um, this is crossing of the great vessels. So this is starting in the subcostal view and going into the long axis right ventricular alpha tract. So in this sweep technique, um, you can verify the crossing of the great vessels at the level of the valve. And you can also visualize the valves clearly and moving freely. And if you notice too with colored Doppler, it also confirms you know, the crossing just by the different color directions or the angle of insinuation of the arteries to the beam. So this is normal crossing of the great vessels. So now moving into the three vessel trachea views. So why the three vessel, three vessel trachea view? So here we're able to determine the course and the connection of the aortic and ductal arches. This also helps in identifying ductal dependent, dependent lesions. Um, also we're able to identify the relationship of the arches to the trachea and also size of the vessels relative to each other. So we're able to determine any discrepant abnormalities. So um, most of the time, the three-vessel, three-vessel trachea view is abnormal in most congenital heart disease involving the outflow tracts. And you want to take note that this does not replace the left ventricular outflow tract or the RVOT. This is pretty much in addition to the outflow tracts. And with addition to color Doppler, we're able to determine the direction of flow of the vessels. Okay, so just going through the normal um, anatomic structures, we see at the level of the three vessel view, the ductal arch view. Here we have the main pulmonary artery, which uh, moves on to the ductus arteriosus, continues to the ductus, and we have the ascending aorta, and here we have the superior vena cava, and as well the trachea. So it's again, very important to know where the vessels are in relation to the trachea. So these vessels should be oriented from left to right, anterior to posterior, with an oblique orientation. So largest to smallest, you have the PA, um, if not slight, if larger, if not slightly equal to the aorta, and the SVC being the smallest. And with the three vessel view, main pulmonary bifurcation, so just a few millimeters below from the three vessel duct arch view, we're actually able to identify also the uh, main, uh, main pulmonary artery, uh, branches, such as the left pulmonary artery that we see here and the right pulmonary artery. Now, a few millimeters above the three vessel trachea view, here we're able to see the three vessel uh, trachea view. So here um, we have the orientation of the aorta and the ductal arches being to the left of the trachea. So this is what defines them both as a left ductal arch and left ductal arch and giving this nice V configuration. And so this is how you're able to pretty much detect um, any type of arch abnormalities. And also we're able to see uh, the SVC in this view and also the thymus. So any absence or hypoplastic thymus is the marker for congenital heart disease, specifically deletion 22Q. And when assessing the three vessel views with color Doppler, um, there's anterior posterior, anterior posterior flow in both ductal and aortic arches. And this should be to the left of the trachea and towards the spine, giving it this V-shaped configuration as you see here as well. And reversal of flow in either vessels is abnormal. So when utilizing color technique, you wanna utilize a high PRF 
of at least greater than 60 centimeters per second and a small color box to increase that frame rate, especially when turning on color. And with a very simple sweep, so starting from the four chamber and angling up towards the fetal head and even all the way up to the three vessel uh, trachea view. So this in this three second sweep, we're able to rule out major congenital heart defects and it's even more so with color Doppler. And here's just a, you know, a, a checklist that you could see in my next slide here um, of the three vessel view, three vessel trachea view. Um, you want to ask yourself when assessing these specific areas, is there a normal number of vessels? So again, look for three. Normal shape of the vessels. The PA should be greater if not equal to the aorta. Um, also, the, again, assessing in size. Uh, normal arch sidedness. So the pulmonary artery and the aortic arch ducts, uh, uh, arches should be left to the trachea. Also, the normal direction of flow and also presence of a thymus. So what to look for, again, is if there's any abnormal vessel course or alignment, abnormal vessel number, even abnormal vessel size, and abnormal color Doppler pat pattern. So typically, um, most of these findings often present together. So case six. So here, you're know, just looking at this three vessel view, we do see what you can see an additional vessel. And this is um, pretty much the fourth vessel located left to the pulmonary artery. So this ended up being consistent with a persistent left SVC. And here you can see that the four chamber, um, you know, demonstrates a cross-sectional view of the left, left SVC at the border of the left atrium. Um, you could also appreciate the dilated coronary sinus in the region of the mitral valve. So it's very you know, important to be aware of the anatomic course of the coronary sinus because this can lead to a huge pitfall. So here you could see um, in this up image to the upper right, you could see at the level of uh, the uh, level of the dilated coronary sinus. As we move further back, you can actually see the coronary sinus in its entirety towards the posterior portion of the heart. Um, this can actually resemble um, the pitfall may resemble also an atrial ventricular septal defect. And just by looking at this, you can see that you're, you're losing your, um, you see what we have the linear insertion of the AV valves. And you know, this is usually a typical finding with um, AVSD defects as well. So again, this is a pitfall. So now moving on to the short and long axis views. <laughs> So in assessing um, the short axis views and low here, we're able to assess for any um, e evaluate ventricular function and also taking a look at the septum. Um, you know, you can also identify the ventricles by the septal leaf attachments. So mitral valve has no septal attachments and the tricuspid valve has septal attachments. And as you continue to sweep towards the apex, um, you're able to see the left ventricle free wall papillary muscles. So that's also one of the ways to kind of identifying, you know, in cases that you have a patient um, that for suspected um, cataraxy, uh, where all, you know, the vessels or the, the chambers are switched. Um, one of the things to take a look at is taking a look at these ventricular, uh, ventricle characteristics such as this as well. So left ventricle has free wall papillary muscles. And with color Doppler, you want to see through the short axis view from the apex to the great vessels and to assess for any ventricular septal defects. Um, again, you know, technique is key for being able to identify any specific defects with color. Uh, you wanna keep your color box small, just kind of uh, tight around the specific structure you're assessing. And this is to increase the frame rate and also keep your, color, your scale to low. So I'd say less than 30 centimeters per second. So moving on to the long axis view in fetal echocardiography. So here we see the normal aortic arch components, such as the right atrium, left atrium, the ascending aorta, descending aorta, right pulmonary artery, the nominate vein you can see here, and the thymus gland and the distal end of the ductus arteriosus, which we'd actually not seen in this view. So we include these in 2D color Doppler and also part of the required motion video clips. It's very important to know or be familiar with the head and neck vessels. Um, here we have the ascending aorta. Um, we also have the innominate aorta, which is the brachiocephalic artery. 
um, the left common carotid artery and the left subclavian artery. So it's very important to be aware of these specific structures. This is what differentiates um, from the ductal arch are the head and neck vessels. Uh, we also know the aortic isthmus and also the area of the ductus arteriosus. Now with color, um, with the aortic arch, um, it has a candy cane appearance. Um, the aortic arch originates from the middle of the heart and color flow should be prograde across the aortic, across the arch and should be smooth and laminar in flow. So again, if you notice too, my box is pretty much kept tight around the specific structure. We utilize a high PRF. Um, so anywhere again, greater than 60 to 80 centimeters per second. Um, sometimes I utilize a high definition Doppler just to kind of see the head and neck vessels. Um, but I utilize color a lot just to, to, to determine if there's any type of aliasing going within the arch. So again, technique is key when you know, evaluating these arches. So with the ductal arch, um, here you're able to see the, the left atrium, right atrium. You're also able to see the tricuspid valve, right ventricle, pulmonary valve, um, main pulmonary artery, right pulmonary artery, left pulmonary artery, ductus arteriosus, and the descending aorta. Um, I like this view because if you, if you notice here, you can see the ductus arteriosus, and as well, you can see a little bit of the aortic arch slightly coming in. It's again, very important to differentiate these two and also to recognize how close they are um, in terms of, you know, in scanning um, the fetus, how you could easily sometimes uh, confuse the two or confuse this for an aortic arch rather than a ductal arch, especially in cases where um, there's like a hypoplastic transverse arch. So differentiating the two is key. And we're looking at the ductal arch. It arises from the right ventricle, which is the most anterior chamber. It gives this hockey stick shape and also connects to the descending aorta. Color Doppler flow should be from right to left flow. And you wanna see flow uh, from the right to left, shunting blood away from the lungs and ductus arteriosus should be wide open, as you could see here, when evaluated with color Doppler. Smooth laminar flow. When assessing the SVC and IVC, we assess this with a 2D, um, 2D, I know color Doppler as well, and also a motion video clip. And here you can see the corresponding structures. Um, here we have the SVC, the right atrium, the IVC, this is the liver, fetal liver, and you can also see the gestation valve in this view. When assessing the uh, bicaval view, you wanna make sure that the vena cava sizes should be similar. Now, sometimes you'll notice that there's a little bit of a slightly dilated area, which is the proximal portion. And this is um, within the IVC, and this is where we have the umbilical and hepatic veins drain. So this may be slightly enlarged, but, but this is mainly because of these vessels inserting through that area. But you wanna look at the vessels throughout, making sure that they're similar in caliber. If you notice one that tends to be slightly um, enlarged, then you know, the, these are red flags again, you know, to further assess any specific structures of why, there's, why there might possibly be some type of overload. And with the bicable view with color Doppler, um, here we're able to assess the presence and direction of flow. Again, this helps also in you know, determining or confirming vessel proportions. Um, directional power Doppler may be helpful. So, um, but in this case, I'm using color Doppler and it's because these vessels you know, require like a low, low flow as well. And uh, uh, with directional power Doppler, it tends to be more sensitive to lower flow velocities. Uh, but in this case, I had a really, you know, ideal patient scan, and here you could see a nice, um, you know, filling of the vena cava. Now, moving on to heart rate and rhythm assessment. So, M mode or Doppler technique is to include simultaneous assessment of atrial and ventricular rate. So, again, optimization is key when taking a look at M mode, especially. Um, with a fetal echo. Uh, so you want ideally the four chamber view to capture both atrial and ventricular free walls. You want to use your high res box, which is usually the zoom box that you have available on the ultrasound machines and the cursor intersects to the, to the ventricular and also a wave or walls. And here you could see, um, um, you pretty much see, uh, pretty much see the intersection. And here you can see where it shows the left ventricular wall and also a nice um, interventricular septum and right atrial wall. And here you have your atrial to ventricular wall uh, just showing one-to-one -one AV conduction. So again, four chamber view is the ideal plane to capture atria and ventricular free walls. 
So when looking at the heart, again, so heart should not squeeze. Um, heart should squeeze, not rock. Uh, it's normal, danceable rhythm. Uh, you want to have a normal weight anywhere between 120 to 160 beats per minute and one-to-one -one AV conduction. Okay, and last but not the least is uh, ductus venosus. So this is the only required, um, you know, uh, Doppler in terms of uh, assessing uh, pretty much uh, 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 fetal flow. So the ductus venosus shunts a portion of the left umbilical vein blood flow directly to the IVC. This allows oxygenated blood from the placenta to bypass the liver. And also this can be a predictor for perinatal mortality in preterm IUGR fetuses and fetal cardiac compromise. You could actually see the ductus venosus. So as for uh, Doppler technique, um, here we have two views, both in the axial view. Um, this is the axial view of the abdomen and also the sagittal view. Um, it helps, you know, with technique since the ductus venosus is very, very small. You want to drop your PRF to at least um, less than 30 centimeters per second. And this is to be able to identify the aliasing. And here you could see it in the sagittal view as well, and also in the axial view. And here we just have the normal, uh, you know, quantification across the ductus venosus, displaying the uh, characteristic triphasic waveforms. Um, so S, which is um, in ventricular systole, D, early diastole, and also A, which is in late diastole, atrial contraction. And I thought this was very helpful is to include just the fetal echo checklist. There was a lot that we discussed. I'm going to just try to go through a systematic view, you know, starting with the situs and moving into your four chamber, into your outflows, three vessel trachea views, short axis, uh, your ductal arches, bicaval view, then moving on to your Doppler assessments, cardiac biometry. So in conclusion, you know, it's very important. You have to know your fetal cardiac anatomy to know what you're really looking at. Um, also use a systematic approach when evaluating the fetal heart. Evaluate the ventricular septum perpendicular to beam. So it's always very important to optimize your angle of insonation. So you also want to think, what am I trying to evaluate? And also pay cl close attention to the valves. Valves come and go in systole and diastole. Okay, thank you. At this time, we will begin the Q&A session. From IAC ECHO, I'd like to introduce Katie Gibson. She's our Director of Accreditation for IAC ECHO. She'll be assisting with the Q&A session today. Katie, would you like to start us off? I sure would. Thanks, Kelly. And thank you again, Michelle, for presenting that um, pretty fantastic webinar. I the pictures are beautiful. I can't get over how pretty they are. Um, and also, thank you to Society of Pediatric Echocardiography and American Society of Echocardiography for sponsoring our webinar today. Um, and so let's start off with some fun questions. So earlier, you mentioned a 76811 exam. Could you tell us what that is? Not sure all of us know what yeah. that is. The 76811 is basically, um, you know, it's a code code for a specific detailed, it represents the detailed anatomic scan. So you have the 7605, and I'm, I'm probably opening more, you know, can of worms here. <laughs> 76805 is the basic anatomy scan. Now with the 76811, this actually includes additional views, um, you know, to assess for, you know, the high risk population. So that's the 76811 anatomic scan. And with the 76811, uh, it's pretty, you know, they include pretty much all the heart, most of the majority of the heart views in there. Um, and the only thing is, you know, with fetal echo is just kind of pretty much, you know, assessing, going more further and assessing more with, uh, you know, function of the heart, uh, velocities, and as well as measurements as well. So that's a 7611. So 7611 is a detailed fetal anatomic scan. Thank you for that clarification. That was wonderful. Um, we have had, we had a few questions regarding required measurements. Um, one of the questions was, are measurements of the tricuspid and mitral valve annulus required or optional? And just based off of the guidelines. So the measurements um, based on the guidelines are required um, based on the guidelines um, for cardiac biometry, but I believe Z scores are not, are not currently not required. It's an option. All right. Thank you for this clarification. Success for, uh, you know, pretty much right and left, any possible right and left disproportion as well. Great. Thank you. Um, we saw a lot of really nice images, um, and I like how you pointed out that some could be 
about pericardial fusion, how it could possibly be a normal variant or, um, you know, artifact or just we're seeing so much beautifulness with all of our great new transducers. So <laughs> could you suggest a color scale um, that would be a good setting when you're checking for pericardial effusion? So with for, I would say drop your scale low, um, you know, so going, I would say anywhere less than 30 centimeters per second. So low scale, low low scale to take a look and make sure that that's not pericardial fusion. Cause obviously if it was moving fluid, um, then you'd see the, the flow go around pretty much the heart, the pericardium. So low scale to take a look or to assess for pericardial fusion. Gotcha. So less than 30 centimeters per second. Okay, great. And do you happen to know if there is a cutoff um, measurement number for physiological pericardial fusion? Mm-hmm. Good question. <laughs> that is a good one. <laughs> so for maternal fetal medicine, I know this can individualize based on other institutions, but our institution at Scripps, we use anything um, less than three millimeters is considered a, per- a physiologic pericardial effusion. Anything beyond that would be pericardial effusion. Right. Gotcha. Very number specific. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and where can we find all of these new guidelines that you spoke about? So these new guidelines are available on, on the AIOM website as well. And um, I could also include this as part of the, uh, uh, the PDF handout that people can upload if they wanted to as well. But you can find this on the AIOM website under practice parameters. So these were just released uh, pretty much earlier this year. Okay. Thank you. And is there any document with reference values for the um, AV valves and the semilunar valves, the annulus? Do we have any reference documents for um, what's normal based off of gestational age besides Z-scores? I don't have any on the top of my head right now. Okay. (laughs) I know Z-scores. There is a lot of, um, you know, published material out there in regards to Z-scores with, um, with, with uh, you know, according to gestational age as well. And, you know, that's what we, you know, current, that's what we use pretty much in our lab to, um, you know, help guide us in terms of, uh, you know, what's up, what's up normal versus normal. Right. We have um, a few questions. People were asking for some tips on how to get the three vessel view. Can you give us a few more pointers on yeah. how to get the three vessel view or how to look at the pulmonary artery when trying to rule out tetralogy of flow? So from the from the four chamber, I would uh, just sweep up to, you know, and you're, in, you're coming from the four chamber, just sweep up to, you know, up to the fetal neck. And um, from Usually when you're able to get the pulmonary, you know, right when you get the right ventricular ultra tract, you, you angle up slightly and you're able to get the, um, also the aortic arch. So there you have the three vessel trachea view. So it's just being axial um, and angling up towards the fetal head. Um, that's pretty much it. And sometimes, you know, like it pretty much, as I mentioned earlier with the sweep that I had from the four chamber through the three vessel trachea view, um, it's actually, you know, pretty simple. So it's something to kind of try and practice and implement too, as well. That's great. Thank you. All right. We have another good one. Um, Can you comment or do you have any comments on the SVC aorta Doppler method um, for ruling out arrhythmia? So SVC, so I know with um, some institutions, they actually uh, utilize the SVC and the aorta in which they're able to capture um, for, you know, to assess for any type of arrhythmia. Um, so you have to remember, I'm coming from a maternal fetal medicine perspective, and it's something that we usually don't commonly do as mm-hmm. well. Um, but I know that uh, they, some institutions utilize that for the SVC and the aorta, uh, simultaneously doppling both to assess for fetal rhythm. Great. And I think we have time for maybe one more. Um, let's see. Oh, here's a nice one. I like this question. Um, can you give us some tips for keeping multiples straight? I think a lot of our users are coming from, a lot of our attendees are uh, not coming from maternal fetal medicine background. They're coming from a pediatric cardiology background. So do you have any tips on how to, you know, scan 
Which one? Multiples. That's funny. Yeah. Okay, so with multiples, because we, we see them often. So <laughs> it's like, it's, so with multiples, of course, depends. Now you ask, depends what type of multiples that you do scan. You know, obviously with the dichorionic um, diamnoc twins, they're pretty easy, you know, because they're differentiated by um, uh, pretty much sacs and also like you have a thick membrane. So you just pretty much got to stay in one specific area, like maternal right and maternal left. Now you have difficult ones, such as, you know, the mo monochorionic twinnings. Um, no, it can be very, very challenging. Um, I guess, you know, pretty much what I do is when I start scanning them, I try to just keep my, my, my sector angle width narrow to just that, just that fetus to know that I'm within, you know, cause it's very easy to, if you have, if you could see both fetuses in the same plane, you could easily just merge, slightly merge onto that, to the next, you know, to the, to the other fetus. So, um, one is, you know, just kind of finding an area, like if it's much baby's maternal right, then stick to maternal right. Right. Um, and then if it's baby is like maternal left, then I would say stick to maternal left. Um, not unless you have a fetus, both babies that are moving like crazy, then that's, you know, you would want to pray that baby can actually stay still. <laughs> yes, I think we've all been there. Thank you so much for the great Q&A session. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks again, everyone. And very special thank you to Michelle Perez for her presentation today. Please feel free to contact IAC with any questions that were not answered during the Q&A session. To receive continuing education credit for attending this webinar, please complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. On the left side of the My Account page, you'll click on Webinars. Look for the title of this session, Fetal Echocardiography, Protocol and Technique. Beneath this title, you will click Review Event. On the left, select the Evaluation tab, then click Take Evaluation to complete the survey. Your certificate can then be accessed and printed from the very next screen and any time thereafter through the CE Transcript section on the My Account page. If you have any questions about the survey, please contact us at webinars at intersocietal.org. Once again, we thank you for joining us today and appreciate your participation.